Welcome to Read Between the Lines, a book podcast. I am your host, Molly Southgate, and today I'm discussing classic literature with... Lynn Hedrick. Hi there! How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing great, too. All right, so can you tell me a little bit about why you wanted to come on the show today to talk about classics? I love reading, and I think a lot of people think of classics as something that they should read but not necessarily have a real motivation to do so. But the reason they're classics is that they're really good books. Mm -hmm. And so I'm happy to share about them. Excellent. Um, Well, thank you so much for coming on. I'm so excited to have you. (laughs) It's my privilege. Um, So can you tell me about what makes a classic book? Sure. Uh, There's all kinds of definitions out there. You can find all kinds of people's ideas about what is the classic, but One thing that they all seem to have in common is that essentially it's a book that continues to be read throughout the years since it was published and and it's long standing. So sometimes that makes it hard to really judge more recent books because you don't know. But I think there's more to it. And I think the reason why they're reread so much is that they do the elements of literature really well. They have really strong plots. They have good characterization. The author uses the settings in uh, appropriate ways. The conflict and resolution are done well. They just don't lack in any of those things that make a good book. Yeah. That's why they last. Yeah, I agree. Um, So some people might, I've actually done this before too. I've been guilty of this, can be hesitant to read certain classics because there can be it can be more difficult language wise, even no matter how good of a reader you are, sometimes it can be hard to get into it. Do you have any tips for people like that? I do. Uh, Sometimes it's language. Like uh, sometimes it's even things like there's a lot of symbolism or references to things going on. But if you don't know that you're going to miss a lot. Mm -hmm. And I would suggest that pull up uh, YouTube, pull up uh, book summaries, Look at some of the trailers, even go to some of the literature help sites for for school, like SparkNotes, mm. and pull from there. There's nothing wrong. In fact, it's a, a right thing to give yourself as much help as you can so that you can really get the benefit out of it. Those just help you bridge the gap. The, uh, gap. There's a great website called Owl Eyes that uh, for older books that are in the public domain, you can read through and it's annotated and they give you helps with, hey, this is what this means. It's really helpful. (laughs) Well, that sounds really, I'm definitely going to check that out. Thank you. Um, Do you have a favorite classic book? I think my favorite at this point in time and my favorites are very changeable, but Mm -hmm. I think my favorite right now is The Count of Monte Cristo for an older one and To Kill a Mockingbird for a more recent one. I love To Kill a Mockingbird. Yeah. Do you know, like, for certain books like that, is there a certain type of classic that attracts you more than others? There are some that are easier for me to jump at. And it's usually because it's in a genre that I already like, or I know that it has a topic that I already am interested in. I challenge myself to read through and go for some that I wasn't necessarily drawn to. and for many times when I've done that, I've been rewarded. Yeah. Um, so what books did you love when you were my age? Or like, Well, for reference to the audience, I'm 13 right now. Or like, not like kids younger like that. around. That. Right. I've always been a pretty wide interest reader. At your age, I was kind of just transitioning from... Uh, I went through a year, a couple of years where I had been reading every bit of folklore oh. I could get into. I was reading myths and legends and from every country, every book that I could get my hands on. And I was just transitioning into more older science fiction and fantasy, older for me at the time, which mm-hmm. means I was in early, let's see, early 80s when I was your age. So older sci-fi and fantasy were things that were written in the 50s and the 60s. Uh, I was starting to really get into those. 
Cool. So you mentioned that you loved like folklore and mythology. Do you still, is that still an interest of yours? And I do. At those shelves behind me, you can find several. Oh. <laughs> several books of them. And I actually teach a class on oral tradition books cool. as well. Um, do you have any favorite myths specifically or like types, like from certain regions or anything? I, well, United Kingdom's one of my favorite. I have a lot of family heritage. I also am descended from the same town that the Grimm's brothers Grimm lived in. Oh, really? Uh, in Germany. Oh, that's so really cool. There's maybe some of my ancestors were told some of the stories that they wrote down. <laughs> And oh my gosh, that is incredible. Yeah, I, I love the I love the Grimm stories. And um I went through a phase where I also got like really into mythology. It was mostly Greek mm-hmm. mythology, but I loved like all the Brothers Grimm stuff. Um and I would read it with my mom, and we were always so shocked at how dark it was. Yes, very dark. Well, it's how we deal with the human condition in story. Yeah. And you deal with things that go wrong and and how to get by it. Yes. And that's where I also really, really loved Welsh and um, oh. Celtic mythology a lot too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm taking a class on that right now, like on a bunch of different mythologies of the world. And like that's uh-huh. in there and it's so good. Um, so do you have any classic novels that you would recommend? There's, there's so many and such a wide range that rather than a specific one, I'd say go with a genre that you really like already and go with one of the classics in that genre because every genre has its classics. It's long standing ones. Mm -hmm. Uh, So if you liked, you know, if you like drama and the human uh, just dealing with all kinds of the um, difficulties of human life, I would go with something like Count of Monte Cristo or of course, To Kill Mockingbirds and that. Jane Austen's written that. Jane Austen's books are great for banter and real witty dialogue and yes. the snappy comebacks. I mean, she was one of the first. And slow burns. Uh, that's right. Very good at the slow burns. Yeah. Shakespeare's also awesome for snappy comebacks and slow burns. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. I, a lot I of original sure. plots, but you'll find some great dialogue. <laughs> Yes. Well, you could also argue that you don't find a lot of original plots now coming from that type of thing. And, and, you know, it's not that easy to come up with a completely brand new story. And and if you look broadly enough, you know, you can always make you can make connections. It depends on how specific you want to get. The more specific, the easier it is to say it's new. Oh, yeah. I heard a good joke once that said that Shakespeare was so incredibly talented. He took the four most easily identified uh, plot lines and he, he worked very hard to condense them into 16 stories. Yeah. <laughs> he just kept repeating them. <laughs> yup. Um, my favorite thing about that is that he, back then, I, cause I, I love learning about like Shakespeare and that type of thing. <laughs> he would watch plays and go I like that but I can do it better and so like there were a lot of his shows that were more like spite filled like trying to do it trying to one-up the person that originally did it absolutely absolutely and he had patronage so he could get away with it and I mean his are the ones that we mostly remember so yeah it helps to have a queen who really likes your work and makes sure that uh your your plays get put on Definitely. So, um, Elizabeth, thank you for keeping Shakespeare yes, for us. Definitely. Um, <laughs> so can you speak on the importance of reading classics? Yeah, it's, I think the biggest thing that you gain when you read a classic is a really good example of great plot lines, great characterization, great setting. What does that look like when all of those elements of literature are in place and are done really well. It compels you to want to finish. It compels you to want to read more. It compels you to think about it and consider. It adds to your life. Mm-hmm. And it will, I believe, reading classics will enrich all of your reading. Yeah. And when reading older books in general, do you find that it kind of feels like a time capsule almost? A lot of times it does. It's in 
it's not a history textbook, mm-hmm. but it helps history. Many of them help history come alive. Yeah, they really do. You get to take someone like a Dickens and you get a picture of class life. Although I will say Dickens is far from my favorite author. <laughs> oh, do you I have know, a favorite? I, I, I don't, I really like parts of Victor Hugo. I really like Jane Austen. Uh, the reason I don't like Dickens is that he's so wordy. Yeah. That he's a lot of work. I love his stories. I, the stories he tells are amazing. He just takes, you know, if he could say something in five work, words, he t- takes at least 15 to say it. Oh, yeah. There's a lot. <laughs> I've read a lot of authors that it's like pages and pages. Okay. Just... Could have had a sentence. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely. Um, uh, but his stories were good. And that's why he's a classic author. Definitely. So what do you think of adaptations of classics? Like, do you have any favorites? And like, in general, what are your thoughts on like taking something like that and like reworking it again and again? I think that it can be a really great idea. I think it's a way to draw people in who might feel intimidated reading it originally in the original, uh, help them help them to find a connection. A lot of people will read or watch an adaptation and then they're a little more willing to go and get the original a try. And it makes a little more sense. It's easier to follow. Mm-hmm. I have a favorite book adaptation of classic of a set of classics. It's oh. a series by a Welsh author. His name is Jasper Ford. And he made a science fiction series that's based on classics and crime novels and science fiction and oh. tons of humor. So much sarcasm. They're called the Thursday Next Books. Okay, I'm going to check those out. You really need to. Basically, you get to a point in the series where people can travel in and out of books and uh, into the world of the book where it's like a movie set. And oh, the characters are on or off, depending on whether someone is reading them at the moment or not. And oh, that's a really interesting take. It really, really is. I highly recommend them. Yeah. So I'm Jasper, gonna... Jasper Ford, two Fs, uh, and uh, Thursday Next series. Yeah. Everyone listening to this, if you've read those or if you go check those out, write into the show to tell me what you think, all right? Um <laughs> Yeah, because I've I've read books like that where they have takes on like going inside of stories. Um, actually, the book Land of Stories did that, mm-hmm. especially um, I think I believe it was their fifth book, and they go into like the boys creative writing journal. And it was so, so cool. And I love I love that kind of thing, like splitting worlds up. Um, I say yeah. that a lot with like Alice in Wonderland and Wizard of Oz combined. Uh-huh. I see those a lot. Absolutely. Alice in Wonderland's a really interesting one. That's another classic I love that really, really benefits from studying a bit before you read it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Alice in Wonderland is a logic textbook. Oh, (laughs) I've I've read that. I've read that one a lot, like the original. Um. (laughs) It it, it is. All all of the the little vagaries of the characters are logical fallacies. And you can identify them. <laughs> oh, that's really cool. And the second one, Through the Looking Glass, mm-hmm. is he took a chess game and novelized it. You can yeah. set up a chess board and move the pieces with the elements of the story. That one I caught because I've read both of those books. Um, and I've been reading those, like rereading those books for <laughs> ages, like since I was pretty little. Um, and I remember when I read the second one, I was like, you could play this. Absolutely. You can. You can. Someone did. Oh, <laughs> and he wrote oh, that's it. Cool. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about like finding like layers of like metaphors and symbolism in these books? Sure. Absolutely. One of uh, one of the best in, uh, examples of that, I think, is George Orwell's Animal Farm. Mm-hmm. On the, the face of it, it's a story about, you know, pigs taking over. Uh, a farm and running it, but it is almost a straight one-to-one retelling of the communist takeover of Russia. Oh, 
And especially the farther we get in time from that time, the less people recognize or realize it. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, In the time that it was written, it it wasn't even something that really had to be talked about because everybody recognized it immediately. Uh, But now reading it, you need that little hint of, hey, this is representing Lenin and this is representing what, what they did. And it was a cautionary tale. You can, everyone can pick up. It's a cautionary tale. Yeah. But, but to see that it had almost a one-to-one historical uh, counterpart. And the same is true with Wizard of Oz. Oh. Frank Baum wrote that almost all of the incidents in there refer to things going on in the political landscape of the U S at the time that he wrote it. Oh, so no. you can read it just as it is, as a story that he told his kids, but he drew all of his inspiration from things going on in the world around them. He was a newspaper man. Oh my. Yeah. That's another one that I've been like rereading since I was really little too. And so I, like some of these, I didn't even pick up on it. Cause I was like, what? Eight, 10. <laughs> right. You don't know. But so I, now I'm really wanting to go back. Yeah, to go back and look at that. And yeah, there's a lot yeah. of evidence that um, seems to say that uh, the Wicked Witch of the East is actually based on his mother-in-law who lived east of them. Oh. <laughs> and, came. Oh. and so he kind of told stories in code. I'm sure that she liked that characterization. <laughs> I, I never heard about her reaction, but I could only <laughs> guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, lo- I love hearing about things like that. When you learn about like how authors kind of like hide in like, oh yeah, this, this villain's based on this one that That's I know. Right. This and... this actual person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to word this question. So sure. like when there are certain people who read the books and don't do as much like research and stuff like that, and they can misinterpret the books. And sometimes it can be for a detriment, like they can use it at a talking point and it won't work quite as well. Absolutely. What do you think about like when that happens, like how to educate people like that more gently? Well, I think one of the biggest culprits of that is actually the tendency that schools have to teach literature by having giving an excerpt of a couple chapters of a book and then moving on and saying, okay, so this is what, you know, they, they get these textbooks and they have a chapter or two and you read that and okay, that's, that's Pride and Prejudice. I read two chapters of it. I kind of get what that book's about. Only they don't. And you don't have enough with all of the literature to try and cover to just give these little tastes, often it, it, it you need more than a taste to really appreciate it. So I think we should teach literature in a different way. I think we should read whole books and we should have more discussions and give, don't, don't uh, demonize using websites like SparkNotes to help people understand. Yeah. Yeah, like if, if you're just re- using SparkNotes and not reading the book, then that's more sure. of an issue. But yes, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Like, as an avid reader, <laughs> and you're a teacher, so like I am. people I am. listening to this, <laughs> you've got a teacher's seal of approval. Like <laughs> you really do, and and it's easy enough for for teachers and curricula writers easily could do this to ask questions that that just ask a student to connect things to their own life. Mm-hmm. You can only do that if you've read the book. You can't do that if you've read only Spark Notes. And also that kind of thing is so, so important to do. Like I, it's like, it's a whole new way to connect to media. And like even t- the type of thing that you wouldn't usually get. Cause like I'm an actress. And so like when I do that kind of thing, I kind of have to do that. Like with any, every script I get. <laughs> But um, so like I've started doing that just like in every area and it opens me up to like so many more books, more movies, everything. Like I understand stuff better. We all do. That's how we work. Everything makes more sense when we can put it in a context, our own context. And I think it makes it would help a lot more of those books that someone was just assigned to read in school and they never really got it. And then the class just moved on if they'd had that opportunity to connect it to themselves, to take the time to get to know that book, mm-hmm. then I, I I just think even if you don't see as much, you don't may not read as much of the 
the literature to go more in depth on fewer books would uh, benefit everybody. Yeah. Do you have any other thoughts on like how literature is taught in schools and like doing curricula for more homeschoolers (laughs) and that kind of thing? Sure. Well, I am a bit biased because I actually have written my literature classes and I Mm -hmm. teach them the way that I, I teach them. And I would love to see a model. I've had good feedback from students too, is that instead of everybody reading the same book or part of the same book to take a, some common theme for me, I do it chronologically and uh, have each person read a full work, but each read a different full work, become the class expert on that work, and then teach the other students about your work and they teach you about theirs. So you in depth, one a month, eight books in my American Lit class, say eight books, you know, very well. But if you had 10 students in the class, you're going to hear about 80 books and you're going to be able to dialogue and have conversations and compare and contrast your book with their books. I love that so much that I I really I really do, because like I I was in a great literature course, too. And it in that class, they did it a couple of weeks. They didn't do it every time, but they would have a student go, okay. I want you to read this book. So the students would choose for each other. And yes. like, I, I love that idea of giving the students the wheel a little bit more. Absolutely. You know, you learn so much more when you teach subject, even if you're just teaching a little, a little bit of it. Uh, if you're teaching one aspect, you get so much more depth than a student or a hearer does. And why should we restrict that? Yeah. We're not empower and let people become an expert. And I'm there if someone didn't understand or is off base or is off mm-hmm. base. That's my job is to help with that. But yeah. the students teach each other about their books in my literature classes. I adore that. And it also helps instill a love for reading. It does. Because you don't or know if kids are, are like reading that much at home and stuff like that. Like you don't know. And if they're just if you're just going, okay, I want you to read these 10 books. And you're going to read an excerpt and that is it. And like move along and like you move on. this. And I want you to think these things about it. And like, right. No, but having them you, choose. You I tell I, us I, what you got out of it. You tell us this was a great book. This was a terrible book. This was, I you know that's okay. Mm-hmm. You cannot like things, but know why you don't like it. So. That's my guiding. Definitely. I think that's really awesome. Um, So do you have a most influential book or more specifically an influential classic that you've read? I do. There is hands down one book that has influenced my life more than any, any other book has or, or ever will. And that's the Bible because it's got everything. Mm -hmm. It's got from story to history, to wisdom, to, drama to everything. Yeah. (laughs) So that's been my most influential book. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So I'm trying to think if I have any other questions for you today. Well, you did ask me about a character that I related to or so that's a possibility. Oh, Oh, yes, yes, yes. So (laughs) um, do you have a book character that you relate to the most? I do. I actually have three. Oh, perfect. Um, and these are longstanding ones. Uh, the first, and it's really more, it's not so much about a physical description as their inner thought life and their personalities. That's but, what I intended by the question. So. <laughs> the first one is the character of Talia from Mercedes Lackey's Voldemar series. Uh, it's a fantasy series. Uh, and especially, even it starts with her as a, about a 12 year old and grow, goes into her adulthood and kind of all the way through relate to her a lot I also relate to Shelby from Lori Wick's The Princess and she is a that's a contemporary realistic drama Uh, and uh, finally Simmering from the Enchanted Forest Chronicles which if you haven't read those by Patricia Ruby so they are a hilarious uh, fairy tale version 
Oh, I, I love fairy tale retelling. So I'll definitely have to check that out. You'll definitely need to. When Simmerine has to fight off the princes that keep coming to try and rescue her from the dragon, but she chose to go be with the dragon and she has no interest in being rescued. So oh, she has to chase them off before they bother the dragon and the dragon makes her leave. Deconstructed fairy tales are everything. And Absolutely. people that know that, like, listen to this show. Every time I've got an author who does any or breathes a word about a fairy tale retelling, I'm like all over it. There you go. So many good ones out there right now. Yeah. Patricia Reedy's and Naomi Novik's uh, Spinning Silver and uh, Uprooted are awesome. And Patricia McKillop, so many. Yeah. On and on. <laughs> I have yes. shelves and shelves of them. <laughs> Um, so I have a question about like books that now can be that are classics and like things taught in schools that can be deemed more problematic or have harder to deal with subjects in them. What do you well, think about that? To Kill a Mockingbird is a great example. That is an excellent piece of literature, not just for how well it's written, but because it deals with really serious, difficult but real topics. Racism is something that we need to read about. We need to be exposed to the bad so we recognize it, so we know it's going on, so we shun it. We try to fix it. We fix ourselves at the least. Even if we can't fix the world around us, we can fix ourselves. And Mm -hmm. Huckleberry Finn, it highlights attitudes and ways of thinking and you should be uncomfortable when you read it yeah you should recognize that you know that's not right I know he's a kid but still that thing he's saying bothers me it should bother you it should bother you enough that in real life you're looking and uh, being aware of that going on Uh, there's a certain amount of what age should you read yeah books you know you you should be able to handle the topic uh, before you read the book that is about it. But it's important not to shy away from difficult topics. Otherwise, we can't improve. Definitely. Yeah. And to examine it critically, too, that doesn't mean like go read Huckleberry Finn, for example, um, and go, oh, yes, this is exactly how I should behave because I like this lead character. Well, absolutely. I mean, no, Mark like- Lane was satirical. Yeah, all of his writing is satirical. When when he sets something up as though there, as though it's being approved of or it's the way things are, that in itself is a tip off that there's irony going on here because yes. he only wrote with irony. And that's also part of why it's important to use resources, like what you were saying, and like ask people, like, okay, what do you think of this, and learn more about what it actually is and how the author writes. So that way you aren't reading something like that and just going, oh, Mark Twain is obviously racist and everything's exactly showing like what's wrong in this society. A lot of a lot of the point, even it's even a little bit extraneous whether it was the author's intention or not. If the result, if what you're reading points out to you the problems and makes you aware whether or not the author intended it. Mm -hmm. It's serving a good purpose. Yeah. If it makes you uncomfortable and helps you recognize it's wrong, but it's also really well written. It's well written in such a way with intricate plot in the use of setting and the development of character. Characters is enough that you care about what's going on. Then that highlights even more. Okay, we got to be sure this doesn't happen. Again, I see what was going on then. Don't want it to be that way anymore. How does it change me? Yeah, definitely. Well, um, thank you so much for coming on today. Uh, I I think that's a really great place to end it. I had a great time talking to you. Oh, I did too. Thanks, Molly. For Read Between the Lines, my name is Molly Southgate. And I'm Lynn Hedrick. Let's end this the way all great stories end. Happily ever after, the The end. end. Thank you for listening to Read Between the Lines, a book podcast. This episode is hosted by Molly Southgate. It is edited by Rob Southgate and produced by Southgate Media Group. You can get in touch with the show at readbetweenthelines at gmail.com 
or you can send us a voicemail at 708-887-9473. That was 708-887-9473. You can also find us on Instagram at Read Between the Lines Podcast. Thank you so much for listening.